Welcome to Real Talk with Tina and Ann. I am Ann, and we go into part three of Denise Bard's amazing story with a quote that she mentions from Denzel Washington. Failure is a part of success. If I'm going to fail, I'm going to fall forward. We all have ups and downs in this journey we call life, and it's about perspective. Denise states she changed her lens for a different way of thinking. It's not changing your perspective necessarily, but changing what our focus is on. And I think that is an important message for all of us. I mean, let's listen as she continues her story of overcoming. There is not a person who cannot benefit from listening, and I get to share quite a bit myself. It only takes 30 seconds for someone to make a difference positively or negatively. I even call out a teacher that made a huge difference in my life. Let's listen to part three of Denise Bard's interview. So after I left Anchor House, I went to live with an aunt and uncle. Um, Mother didn't want me back, which was fine because I didn't want to go back. So um, again, it was about transitioning back to or reunification of the family. And I thought it was going to be okay, was kind of led to believe I could stay at my school. Um, Because again, for me, school was my safety. Um, It's where my teacher was. Right. You know, my friend, it's where I was able to survive and have those um, coping things, you know. Um, But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And there was clearly at that home a lot of, um, uh, it wasn't a happy marriage. And that was clear. Okay. So there was a lot of yelling and a lot of anger. And um, I didn't know how to survive in their environment. I just knew how to survive in mine. So I convinced my mom to take me home for a weekend. And I knew my plan was when I got home, I would run. And that's what I did. Okay. And um, I spent a day or over a day um, on the run. And then what is crappy is I went to one of the girls who had been in the anchor house with me. Her mom was a social worker. I don't know her story as to why she was in anchor house, but she was. And her mom supposedly was going to help me, but in fact did not and called the police on me. And, um, Mm -hmm. we, yeah, we, uh, they took me to the youth emergency center where, um, that's where I was explaining that the, um, the fat man came in and said, well, you got two choices. You write down on the paper that you made it all up or you go into the psychiatric ward. Um, so obviously after long process, I decided I'd just say, yeah, I made everything up. Uh, I did go home with my mother and, um, I knew how to survive. And because of everything I had uh, been taught in Anchor House, like those those lessons of, you know, finding the positive, that those positive people, um, that's what kind of made me survive back. You know, I, can, I had now these skills to be able to, um, I already had survival skills, but that gave me more of a boost of good things. Right. So the abuse didn't stop. I just learned, obviously had to get through a lot of it. For instance, one, which people don't understand when I say this. And I think as youth or kids that grew up in an abusive environment, when we learn how to survive through something, it, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's, it's not that sadness. I don't know how to explain that. But for instance, my, when my mom would hit me, I learned if I laughed that she would stop. So the harder she hit, the more I laughed, the harder I laughed, and it would be done in a minute. And she would tell me I'm crazy. But I learned that coping skill. Do you know what I mean? I learned how right. to get through that. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, 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 it was still there. Obviously, abuse changes, you know, through the time, because, you know, you get older and th- certain things just don't fly anymore. But it would um, be so much harder, I think, once you experience a safe, loving environment to go back to that. Oh my gosh. I, you have no idea or I'm sure maybe you do. I, oh God, it was so hard. I had, you know, I would just cry a lot by myself, obviously. I, for my whole life, I had been on the, I I say at the hunt, I have been always looking for a mom. Like it could have been a neighbor, 
It could have been the teachers. And it was, I was just needing that glimmer of hope. And so um, coming out of Anchor House, it was so difficult because I didn't, you know, I was so hopeful going in that maybe this time I'd be rescued. That coming out was difficult because I didn't have that environment. Like you said, there wasn't that caring. The only time I could get that, that safety feeling, that feeling of being loved and cared about was at school by those teachers. So for me, it, it became the one place I knew I could go to and, and have that. You know, when I was younger and even into my 20s, especially, I was the same way. I did not have a very lovable home. And, you know, my, my adopted mom was not one of the best. Mm -hmm. It was a very, it was a really rough environment to live in, very crazy making a lot of abuse. And yeah. so I would always be looking for somebody to, to really love me. And it was the same exact thing. I mean, I was adopted. So, you know, there was always that anyway, but then the home that I was placed in, especially after my dad died, it turned out to be a really horrific environment. And so, you know, it would, I always longed for that mom. Yeah. And I felt really weird about it. And, you know, it's kind of really great to hear yeah. somebody else talk about that because it it's not something that you really wanted to, and when you're in your twenties say, well, you know, I'm kind of looking for a mom still. <laughs> yes. Yes. I said, you know, yes. And, and there again, like I'm sitting here when you said that I'm like, Oh my God, somebody gets it. Somebody gets it. Yeah. Because yeah. Um, well, <laughs> yeah. When I was, you know, I guess when, you're younger, you're like, when I get to be this age, I'm not even going to think about it. It won't even bother me. I won't do whatever. And it's so further from the truth. And as much as I wanted a mom growing up um, and that loving environment and, and, you know, you, you think about it, you kind of play, um, play in your head what it would be like if this person, you know, would rescue you and what that person would rescue you. And you, you, you go through these, these pictures and that's kind of how I, you know, got through a lot of the stuff. Um, so crazy enough that I will share this, that I would take um, pictures out of magazines of like the soap opera stars back in 80s, in, in the 90s. And I would put them in my wallet and and just think, you know what? No, these are my parents. That's not, you know what I mean? Because uh, it, it's just, you wanted that so badly. Yeah. So as an adult, yeah, I still struggle with that. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. It is something that I struggle with. And when I had kids, it was even harder, which is crazy. But even to today, I just wish I had that mom that I can call, that I right. can say, hey, you know, you just want to have like a talk with somebody over the phone with coffee. You, know, you want that place to be able to go home to. You know, I, I have a loving marriage. I do. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, we're happy. We have a great home. I have kids. My life is great. Right. But that doesn't mean I don't have that hole where if the world collapsed, where will I go? If right. everything was swept under me, I don't have someone to go to. I don't have somewhere to go to. And I'll say that, but I also say that I do have wonderful people in my life that were in my life growing up. I have a babysitter that, um, that I talk to every day. Like we message with her daughter. We're about seven years apart and we're on messenger every day. And I know without a doubt, she would be like, Nope, you're coming here. You know, she would absolutely do that. And she tried to help me when I was younger, but she realized that my grandmother and my mother would push her away. So she saw that happening. So the best thing that she can do was to um, allow me a safe environment and a learning environment when I was at her house being babysat, you know, but hey. I'll go to these, even the teachers, I I've reconnected with my CCD teacher back in for, you know, back in for when I was 14 and I go every Wednesday, I have a place to go to at her home. Um, you know, I have my high school teacher and I know that Michelle would be like Michelle, my old counselor. She'd be like, nope, you're coming here. I know that I have these places to go to, 
So when I say that, I don't mean to to say, oh, that's not good enough. Oh, you're being picky. It's just not the same. It's not the same. You don't, yeah. you're not in their holiday photos. You're not invited right. to their, their holiday, um, you know, different things. Like we don't have that. Do you know what I mean? Right. Right. And as adults, like you said, as adults, and, and I'm glad that you shared that with me because that, I don't think anybody has ever shared that with me before. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> you know, I used to try to find teachers and it's really weird. Like, I don't know if it was like I was purposefully looking for a mom or, per. you know, it wasn't really because yeah. you can't really just say, okay, I want you to be my mom. But, yeah, but I, I tried. <laughs> but, but you, I would in my, in high school and in my twenties, you know, I would scope out and, you know, try to find somebody, a woman that I would connect with. So I could be close to them and have somebody that I could confide in and really trust. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm just going to say a math teacher on my end as well. And I was horrible at math too. (laughs) It must be the teachers. Yeah. (laughs) was, you know, her name was Cheryl Conway and I'm Facebook friends with her now. Mm, But I mean, she got, she allowed me to talk with her and she actually came to my house and I think she had dinner with us or something But, you know, she made it a point to make a difference. And you want to talk about that 30 seconds. I mean, it it was, it was more than 30 seconds, but I felt important. I felt heard. Yeah. And, you know, that's all it really takes. And it doesn't take a lot of people. It just takes one or two people to really make a difference in your life to make that different trajectory in your life to say, you know what? You matter. You matter. And that's yes. all because I also had a biological mom that all the way, even until she died, didn't want me in her life because I was conceived in rape. Uh, and she, yes. Um, <laughs> and she told me. I was me, supposedly too. And I wow. was told that my entire childhood too. You are nothing but a rapist child. That's what I, that's the exact words that were told. Yeah. Me. Yeah. We're yeah, nothing we but a rape a to me. <laughs> So, the exact same thing. And so you yeah. want to talk about not having that worth. And yes. then, you know, we talked about, and I want to get to the poem that I shared with you. Oh, please. Yes. Yeah. I'll read that. And then we can talk. I remember many a night when I would pray in the midst of fright to a God I did not know or understand, who I wished would reach down with a gentle hand, wipe away my tears of death, desperation rescue me from my world of isolation from the four walls in which I dwelled looking out the window from a world I knew well wondering exactly what it would be like to be in one of those other bedrooms still lit by light I would stare at them through the hazy mist from my breath till their lights went out as though it were a death a death of a dream that gave me hope that in the midst of chaos would help me cope laying back down with a tear on my cheek praying father I lay me down to sleep in hopes for a new family in which I seek I know I don't know who they are but I pray with much faith that they're not very far now you said when you read that that it was beautiful and sad and I mean you said to me quote I still struggle with not having a mom which you just talked about or somewhere to go home to Yep. And I know that when I was growing up, these were your words that you said to me. I thought once I got to the age I am now, I wouldn't think about it anymore, which you also said on this podcast. Yes. However, I think it is harder now, you said, because when I was younger, there was still hope that mm-hmm. I would be rescued and have that family. Now that hope is gone. And I now and now I work on embracing what I do have and remind myself how far I have come. So, I mean, you obviously never found your forever home, your forever mom, but did you ever come close? That was my question, which you have kind of answered, but you know, you lived in quite a few homes, like bounce back and forth. I did bounce back and forth. Um, Did you ever live with a family or anybody other than your teachers that really you were like, you know, other than the group home? Wow. This feels like family. No, no. Uh, I think, see, that's and so I think sad. that's why I think your poem hit me. Like I, I read that several times last night after, you know, and God, if it isn't like we were in the same brain, 
because I remember too, just, I used to put my headphones on and listen to my cassettes and I would either stare out the window, depending on where I lived. Um, and I'll even tell you, my memories go back to when I was four. And I remember okay. having that, the, <laughs> those little records and listening to it, looking out the window and every woman that went by, I would be like, like I would say, and I'm, I'm telling you this where I've never told people, but I would say under my breath, hi, mom, hi, mom. And it, you know, so I've, I've, you know, looked out the window, I've thought the same freaking thing. I prayed, prayed, prayed. And I used to get mad. And when I say used to in my adult life, in my, in my late teens and in my adult life, and I struggle with that still today. The biggest regret is I just wish I told someone. Now, I don't know that that would have made a difference. I really don't. We don't know um, what could have happened, but that hope was still there if if I just had the courage. And not just the courage, but knowing, like I learned in Anchor House, that what was happening wasn't my fault. And I wouldn't have been afraid. I think we we tend to um, overthink. And if you're like me, then you worry about what other people think and what other people say. And someone recently had said, and I say recent, it was probably a year ago, that you don't know that for sure. Because what you're worried about is the thoughts that are in your head of what they are thinking about and the thoughts that are in your head of what they would say. But whatever it is, that that could not be true. And I think about that because I was worried about telling someone. And the only person that that ended up hurting me, hurting is me. And I think that we do that a lot. Yeah. um, Is to not say something because we're worried about what other people do. So when I talk now, that is something that. I cannot stress enough if there were somebody listening that is in the same situation that we were in. And I I include you because it sounds like we have a lot in common, but that it isn't your fault. And there is someone, and I, I, I had a bad experience and and I, I'll, I'll say it anyway, because, you know, this was back in the eighties and I really do hope that the programs has changed a lot. Although I know that it's probably there's still probably a lot of work to do, but um, I did have a teacher, uh, it's a counselor. She was my seventh grade counselor who called social services to come. And social services had been in and out of my house growing up, just so I should say that, because in kinship care, it is a foster home. Right. So we always constantly had somebody coming. They would come to the school when they saw bruises. I mean, they would ask me what's going on. Well, you're trained to say, I got hurt this way. I got hurt that way. And you don't think anything of it, you know, because it's, dra- it's drilled that if you say something, they're going to take you away from me. And you don't know, you're going to go to bad people. These were like cycle things. But I had a seventh grade um, a counselor who called. And I remember the guy coming to the door. My mother wasn't home. We were in this apartment. And he said, give this to your mom to call me. And I remember like looking at that card thinking, first, I'm terrified. Then second, maybe I have a chance. And this was the year before I went to Anchor House Um, or even six months. It could have been. And when he came, my grandmother came over and my mother was there and we lived in a one bedroom and they sat right outside the kitchen door so they can hear. And so while he was talking to me, I I said the appropriate words, but I wrote on a paper and I'll never forget Uh this. I, I wrote on a piece of paper and said, I'm scared. Please help me. He left and I never saw him again. And he saw the paper. Yeah. I handed it to him. He looked at him and he looked at me. And so. Wow. Those, those going back to the poem and how that relates is that you were just, there's got to be somebody out there. There just has to be, there has to be somebody that wants us enough that they're willing to fight against these darkness, which was, you know, my mother and my grandmother are going to fight against them for me because that they want me. And that's just proof how somebody can take 30 seconds of your life for the negative and Mm -hmm. not help. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I never really thought about that. That is so true. I guess I don't focus on those negative moments. See, thank God. see um, because that's how you're wired. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's um, that, that, yeah, I won't forget your poem because I think that that just God, if I could write a poem, that probably would have been it. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's right. like, that's definitely how it felt. So and, what about the pain of, of these people and how they have, how they hurt you? I mean, do you think that that has subsided or do you think that that's still in there? Um, so I think it's just something that I think it'll always be there. Like I have a fear of certain people in my family. Um, without a doubt, I still have that fear. Um, and, and that's crazy to say as I'm 48 years old. Um, oh, no. but I, 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 yeah, I had fears that lasted me that long. So, yeah, yeah. And so I still have fears and I just try not to allow them to control me. There's this big thing. Everybody is always about, oh, you have to forgive in order to heal. I don't believe that. Um, I don't think that there's forgiveness in the things that happened to me at all, okay. but that doesn't mean I'm not going to heal. For me, it just means, no, I don't forgive you, but no, I will no longer give that power to you. I will no longer allow those thoughts to consume my head. Right. And truly, okay. I mean, it's a work in progress, right. um, but I don't allow it to control me anymore. It's an unforgivable thing of what happened to me. And there are things that I could like detail, but I'm sure your listeners probably don't want to hear that. But um but that's okay. Like I'm, it's okay that I don't free. It's okay. I hate, I hated when people told me that because I thought I would never heal because I couldn't forgive, but it's okay that I don't, but it's my choice that I make that I won't allow them to, um, destroy what I have now, if that makes sense. Right. Yes. I want to talk about this really quick because one of the things you said to me last night was, People are meant to meet for a reason, mm -hmm. even the one, even the ones we wish we never had met. They were yeah. just meant as a lesson. And I can't tell you how many times I have thought about that since you yes. said that. I mean, that made me think about, oh, I've got a list of mm -hmm. people that have hurt yeah. me. And they did take me on a different course in life. Right. But, you know, I've tried to tell myself that I have learned along the way from each of them and I've grown and I've become the person I am because of them. But that was so profound to me. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I believe that. Um, I, I listen to a lot of uh, motivational compilations. One of the things I do for myself every day is I get on the treadmill. I am not a runner. I do walk with a purpose. Um, but I found this year, I started in January, that I listen to, um, I go on YouTube and I hit the compilations of all the, the motivational speakers and I listen to it while I walk. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a speaker, Les Brown, and um, what he says, and this this is, I think I shared this with you, um, is that uh, I don't call it a bad day. I call it a character building day. And so when I think about that and then the people that I met, I do believe that they were building my character. So the choices that um, I made, you know, that, that, that weren't great choices, just like you said, you know, mm -hmm. it was building my character, whether I liked it or not. Um, it was, it, it's, it's never a bad day. It's just building your character. Wow. And so um, I do think about that because we do have that tendency to overthink and especially overthink the, the choices that we made. Um, but the problem is we can't go back and change what we've already done. The mm -hmm. only thing we can do is what did we learn from it? Now let's go. Another quote um, from um, Denzel Washington when he gave a commencement speech, he said, uh, failure is part of success. Um, if I'm going to fall, which is it, it fail, I'm going to fall forward. 
And so okay. um, I, I think about that. Okay. Well, you know what, that situation was pretty shitty, but I'm going to fall forward from it. So okay. what can I learn? And I'm going to get up and I'm going to oh, go. I love that. One yeah. of the things that you also talked about last night was you have a, uh, you talk about having that different perspective that you changed yeah. your lens. So yes. can you talk more about that? Yeah, I think it goes back to um, what my daughter said to me, um, you know, two years ago when I told her my story and um, and she said, you know, I'm so glad that all these people, um, you know, raised you and it. It does it. I mean, I can go back different things and tell you how how that changing my lens stall, um, shifting my focus is probably the best. But um, it put everything into perspective of, wow, I didn't have the mom I wanted, but I did have a collection of moms that collectively mm-hmm. all together made that perfect right. mom. Right. Um, but you know, growing back to being younger and learning from Michelle at the group home um, was to change the lens or shift the focus and find the things that I was ignoring. Um, You know, I'm, again, it's not about changing your perspective on things per se. It's more of changing what you allow yourself to focus on. Okay. Well, that's, that is really important. That's a great yes. lesson because I have told myself over and over and I call it um, thought stopping where, oh, okay. yeah. where as soon as my brain is going in that direction that it's not going to be good, it's going to cause me to, you know, have a negative, a more negative thought or go in a wrong direction. So I do, I just do this thought stopping and I make myself think in a different direction. I, you know, it's funny because I'll say shift. That's okay. my word. Okay. I just go shift. And <laughs> um, sometimes I heard this uh, in a in a support group once where the girl, and she was much younger than me. And I like was like, oh, I don't belong here. And she said, when I start to go back to a certain situation and I get consumed by it, she said, I'll find something close by and I'll tap it, like physically tap it. So it makes me like come back to where I'm at. So it's funny because I use the word shift if I'm going that way. Like, you'll see, I'll shake my head and I'll tap my leg or something. I'll be like, shift, <laughs> shift. And I'm sure people think I'm nuts when that happens. <laughs> but, um, you know, we do what we have to in order to um, move on. You know, we don't want to go backwards. So I think if we get ourselves into staying in that negative thought, you know, we, we have to work hard. I think our job is never going to end. I think we're always going to have to work hard, no matter how shitty that may sound. Um, I think it's just what we have to do. One of the other things you let you said last night was, you know, they broke me, or maybe what you mean is that they tried to break you, but you made yes. a statement, overcoming adversity and changing the story you were born into to the yes. success story that you wrote for yourself. Yes. And I just think that that's one of the most beautiful things. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. No, I, um, I know I say this over and over about Anchor House, but these are the things that I learned from that is that um, when you have people who believe in you until you can believe in yourself. So, oh, that's you know, good. I had all these people believing in me and I couldn't see it until somebody, you know, it clicked. I heard someone, I think, you know, we're not going to resonate with every single person. Um, even though we might say the same thing as a speaker, I can say the same speak speech as another speak, speaker, but that doesn't mean that somebody's going to connect with me. Even though we're saying the same message, we're just not connecting. And I think that once you have someone in your life that you connect with, then um, everything kind of falls in place. And so for me, it was having all these people who believed in me until I learned to believe in myself. And once I was able to do that, um, no, I'm not the story I was born into. Because if I was the story I was born into, statistically, I should be a drug addict. I should be an alcoholic. I should be an abusive person because the cycle would have continued. Um, And I should be dead. 
And so I didn't have to stay in that story. Once I found some, you know, these people and I'll go back to, they probably were there my whole life. I'll go back to the the babysitter. Um, and then there was a family friend who, who tried to rescue me when, um, my mom had me on a fire escape as she was drugged out. Um, all these people, you know, were probably there helping to change my story, but it was, here's a good quote if you want to, um, they say you look like your mother and your father when you're born, but you look like the decisions you, you, you look like your decisions when you die. So wow. all these little things that came along, once I made my decisions, it was no longer that other person's story. Now it's my story because right. now I'm writing it. You can't write my story for me. I'll write it for myself. The ups and the downs, no matter what it is. We're stopping part three there. There was so much meat in this episode and we only have one more left with Denise. Let's change the story that we were born into together and rewrite our story of success. We can all do this together. Thank you so much for listening to Real Talk. And remember, Anchor House in New Jersey, if you have a few bucks that you would like to donate. Next week is the last part of her story. I don't know about you, but I can't wait for it to come out. Let's continue this journey together and see you next week. Hey.